the Texas uh, economy and, and Texas lenders look okay? Am I going to regret saying that? I hope you don't. I, I, that's the same thing I would say. You know, I, I went through the 1980s with Frost Bank and, um, you know, so this isn't our first rodeo. I'll tell you, this is not the 1980s. And uh, you know, the real estate markets that we're seeing now are really not indicative of that at all. I'm not going to say there's not going to be some stress in the markets, but this is definitely not the 80s. You know, I think that um, one thing about the Texas market, and admittedly, that's where I operate, that's uh, where Frost Bank is doing all our business, is that um, 1,000 people a day continue to move into the state. Uh, that means that they need housing, they need multifamily, and they need places to work. So I think that's been a good thing for us. Even if the fundamentals are strong, you could still be guilty of, um, you know, being too profligate, I guess we would say, in 2020, 2021, when valuations were much higher, maybe funding some projects that because of office changes or, or real estate supply and multifamily now don't look so great. Talk about the discipline that uh, you had or if those are even areas where you would uh, traditionally be active uh, in the last couple of years and where that leaves you now. You know, you make a great point. You know, the fact is, it's it's not what you're doing at this point in time. It's what you did three years before and how you underwrote deals and the kind of people that you banked and the structures that you had. And, you know, we report on our conference calls every quarter how many deals we lose to price and how many deals we lose to structure. We lose many more deals to structure. And those deals that we lost uh, at that point look, look better and better at, you know, today. So, it really has to do with banking great people, not not transactions, and making sure that your structures are right. And I think it all works out uh, if you're doing those things. That said, do you still face funding pressures from having to pay whatever you have to pay on your deposits now uh, and not earning as great return if customers are kind of starting to shy away at, I don't know, 9% rates? Yeah. You know, I think that the, for for the banking industry today, we've moved, we've moved beyond what was happening with Silicon Valley right after that. And what we're hearing of, you know, not just ourselves, but from our community banks, and just for example, Texas has about 450 banks, <clears throat> and we bank about about half of those banks. And what we're hearing from them is a lot of that dust up has settled down. But what they're trying to do now is figure out what cost will it take in order to grow deposits and maintain the ones you have. That's really more of an operating margin issue, and they're dealing with that. But that's a business issue as opposed to the kinds of liquidity issues that people were dealing with 60 days ago. I think that, um, you know, it's, it's something that they're all going to have to look at, and they're going to have to look at their cost structures and, and what it takes to be successful. The, the last question is kind of the, the biggest hanging over the whole industry right now. Um, do we need, you know, you know, to change deposit insurance or not? Will that just do more moral hazard? Do you feel like you're at a disadvantage because you're not on the same playing field as a J.P. Morgan with an implicit government uh, guarantee? You know, um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, I don't think we need fully insured deposits for everyone. I do think it's a moral hazard. But you got to remember, we're a 155-year-old bank that's uh, that's been through a lot of things. I was reading our 1933 annual report, and then the chairman at that time railed against a new program that today we call FDIC. He thought it was a big moral hazard. Hmm. So I, I, I believe that you need to have it. I think it should probably go up from the 250 to. An inflation-adjusted number, but I think it's not—it's not something that we need to do to have universal uh, insurance. You know, and I think it's important for us to get past this developing stigma around uninsured deposits. You know, the the commercial bank model really doesn't operate on a fully insured basis. I mean, let's take a, a developer that wants to have a fifty million dollar project in a community. It's going to create jobs. What are we supposed to do? We're we supposed to take all, cobble together all these two hundred fifty thousand dollars savings account, lend it to him. What are those people supposed to do when they want mortgages? Right. And they want uh, they they want credit for their own families. And so you know, it is a situation where we have a noble profession of bringing together people who have excess funds to people who need it. You don't have to be the smartest guy in the room, but it takes discipline mm -hmm. and it takes probity to do it. And I think that. Uh, we really need to get comfortable with that because that's how we grow communities. You can't grow a bank on scared money. You can't grow a community on scared money. That is a quote uh, to put on the wall. Phil, the only thing I'll say that's unsettled me about this interview is that you're reading the 1933 letter to, to shareholders <laughs> or annual letter. <laughs> I'll admit to that. I do. Yeah.